Hello, my name is Lane Little and I'm the director of the Polly Friedman Art Gallery at Misericordia University in Dallas, Pennsylvania, which is in Northeast Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us for the Compulsory Measures Virtual Artist Roundtable. In this series of nine conversations, we'll be talking to the artists from the show about compulsory measures and about their creative processes. This series was made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities CARES Grant entitled Humanities in the Time of COVID-19, Fostering Community Dialogue. In this episode, we'll be talking with Rennie Gower. Rennie is the curator of the exhibition, Compulsive Measures, Repetition, and Ritual, which is on display in the galleries until October 18. Rennie taught art at Virginia Commonwealth University until her retirement in 2018. She is a practicing artist, teacher, and curator whose work has been recognized internationally, most recently by the Pollock Krasner Foundation. Her works, which you see behind me, use the circle as a repetitive decorative motif, as a metaphor for binary code, and as a cultural symbol of continuity and infinity. Renny, welcome. Thank you for participating in this virtual roundtable series. I'll let you tell us more about your practice and then I'll ask some follow-up questions. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm just delighted to um, take part in these conversations and I wanna thank you and um, the university and the Polly Freeman Gallery, of course, for hosting the exhibition and the nine, nine webinars <laughs> that, you are, <laughs> that you are hosting. Um, and I, if you will indulge me, um, I'd like to start the conversation wearing the hat of the curator and then I'll switch to the wearing the hat as the artist. So to do that, I'm, I'm gonna share my screen and then we'll go from there for a little while. <clears throat> Are we good? <clears throat> All right, so the title, um, Compulsory Measures, has several allusions, and its obvious reference is to, to OCD, which is Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, and this me mental illness goes way beyond habits. It causes unwanted thoughts or urges or to do something repetitiously, often in a certain order or with a constant checking or accounting or a lining up of objects in a very precise way. It might manifest itself as excessive hand washing, multiple checks to ensure a door is locked, or even the oven is off. And I would have you think of um, Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang. <clears throat> the illusion is also to the compulsory figures in competitive figure skating, which are the circular patterns the skater traces on the ice as perfectly as possible. Since practice makes perfect, the skater's muscle memory enhances their skill development. And just as scales help a musician develop that facile technique required to perform major compositions, so compulsory figures help skaters develop the expertise required to free skate. And it's a simple shift that takes this muscle memory into drawing. The word measures implies an orderly precision and a process, as well as to the great length someone might take an action or a method. So all the artists in compulsory measures embrace this repetitious marking and ritual, and I would say bordering on the obsessive, as mindful ways to address um, the issues that face our world today. The exhibition actually evolved out of a panel discussion that um, was presented in 2017 at the annual CPCAC conference, which is a national um, gathering of artists, designers, historians, and um, educators. Um, and the panel actually included four of the eight artists in the exhibition. Let's see, go forward. Oops, not moving. <laughs> Here. That's okay, do you wanna try? Oh, there you go. Let's see if I can keep it up. So why do we make marks? Is marking so instinctual or animal-like we feel compelled to mark our territory with a line rather than a scent? Or is it a primitive petition or a ritualistic prayer? You know, you consider those secretive drawings made with color earth and charred sticks in the ancient caves. Or is it a compulsion just to create order or to keep track of events, days, or even years? And I would have you think of the prisoner who scratches hatch marks into cell blocks to maintain a coherent sense of time. Is marking proof of one's existence simply because the record affirms the self who made it? So, Think about names carved into trees or scratched on bathroom stalls or sprayed onto urban facades. Or is marking or the act of making with one's hands an anodyne for something that we've lost through the social distancing that permeates our digitized culture? 
So as the curator um, of compulsory measures, um, all of these questions are linked to my um, interest in the works that are in the show, but also my interest um, in the manic response that's manifested in the artwork of visionary and mentally ill artists, as well as the anxiety-driven work that was often produced by my former students. In this image, you can see works by Adolf Wolfley and Martin Ramirez that flank the two middle images. Um, they were major artists in spite of their illnesses. Both were institutionalized for most of their adult lives as schizophrenics. Wolfley in Switzerland and Ramirez in California. Both were displaced from their places of birth, they were separated from their families, and they initially worked as itinerant laborers. And they both had advocates and doctors that had an interest in arts, and they studied the arts as a means to understand the mental illness. Likewise, with an anxiety always on the rise, uh, my students always approached their work, often approached their work, with an obsession that bordered on the compulsive. And I really thought they were employing the repetitious mark as a meaningful metaphor that they could charge through the act to calm their fears. It no longer really surprised me to learn that they were medicated or suffering from depression or under a doctor's care. And so I really searched for ways to work with these students and it led me to a lot of different artists and authors and ideas. And I also must admit that I work somewhat obsessively in my own studio practice through, the act, through a very active making to achieve a calm, more contemplative, more mindful approach um, to the events that impact my life. So here are two examples of former students. Patrick Binks uses um, complementary colors and the offset the registration of the print on the left to amplify the intense visual vibrations and the emotional unease. And in Sean Thornton's work on the right, it's characterized by complex combinations of symbols that he derived from a variety of cultural and spiritual traditions. During art school, um, he began to experience psychedelic visions, which were actually the result of a brain tumor. And these visions began to appear in his paintings. He labors over each piece for months or years, and he slowly builds up these intricate layers of color pattern. Two collections, um, the Prinzhorn Collection and the American Visionary Art Museum Collection in Baltimore, Maryland, also provide stunning points of reference. The Prinzhorn Collection is a unique archive of over 5,000 works. Um, by psychiatric patients, mainly schizophrenics, who were confined to asylums scattered throughout German-speaking countries across Europe between 1890 and um, 1920. The German art historian and psychiatrist, Dr. Hans Prinhorn, assembled the works to study the mental illness of his patients. But he also differentiated the works of these patients as works of art. <clears throat> so you can see his research revealed that the mentally ill Patients often followed an inner necessity that was absolutely uncompromising. They sought consistent, often static, formal solutions to help them create order in their worlds. And their work was usually distinguished by enormous productivity because it was a matter of life or death. In cases of severe psychotic collapse, their engagement in an artistic activity became a search for meaning that attempted to counter the erosion of the self that was caused by the psychosis. And these are just a couple more examples <clears throat> from that collection of these meticulously deconstructive drawings and schematics. And you might think of cathartic doodling, um, things that we do kind of randomly and, and you know, repetition of, of, of patterns and marks that calm, our, calm you down. Okay, so the American Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore is another unique collection of over 4,000 pieces that um, are produced by self-taught individuals. And um, they mount exhibitions, and one of them was called The End is Near, which examined um, visions of apocalypse and utopia. And it focused on artists um, that reacted strongly to crisis, such as the imminent end of the world. They should do one on COVID, I think. Their phobias became the catalyst for their art, and often their works prophesized doom and destruction or described otherworldly experiences. So the two artists here, Paul Laffoley and Joe Coleman, were in the end of the year, and they both had troubled childhoods and, and some mental instability. <laughs> so now you ask, <laughs> do I think all artists are insane? Well, not, no, certainly not. 
However, I do believe many artists adopt methods that embrace similar strategies of repetition and ritual to create meaning. And I think you will see this, I'll bet, in quite a different way in my work as well. I think you will excuse me, immediately notice that my work is not self-referential or narrative. Rather, it is informed by sacred geometry, which I believe is the universal language of perfect geom geometric forms that can speak to humanity's shared cultural heritage. And so whether my work is crafted from paint, paper, or mixed media, I have incorporated the circle and the square and the triangle as metaphors, as Lane said, for binary code, perfection, and infinity. First inspired by the grid and American peace quilts, I now incorporate the entwined patterns of Celtic knock work and Islamic tiles. So in the few slides that follow, I have um, added visual footnotes um, to the artwork with images from around the world that inspire me. <clears throat> and I'm sure you will recognize the internal fractals and the geometric connections. And I have explored many things over the past 40 years, but some issues do remain constant. And some of those are my desire to craft a visually complex work through a laborious and repetitious process that will counter visual skimming. Or in other words, to create immersive works that slow the viewing process down for the viewer. Um, I want to engage an active audience through abstraction and the use of physical materials and the manip manip manipulation of those materials. I want to create a private space within a public one and I want to transcend and try to transcend difference through design. So working with a, a wide range of materials, my paintings are mixed media constructions, I think it's fabricated from lots of materials. <coughs> um, through process-based improvisation and systemic or systematic marking and patterning. Um, and when we flip back to um, the video view, you'll see a piece behind me, which is a good example of that. And so through my travels and my research, I have discovered many universal decorative motifs that I embed into the substructures of my paintings. And I ultimately deconstruct them through the tearing down and rearrangement of the layers. My process is both systematic and fluid, and I combine a lot of opposite textures, light, dark, heavy, opaque, transparent, um, open, closed, to create these almost chaotic um, combination, very disjunctive combinations that ultimately add up to something that's more harmonious and balanced. So I kind of think of it as organized chaos. <laughs> so moving to these works on paper, they're created at the same time that I work on the mixed media pieces, and they're very similar to the ones that are behind Lane in the, her video image. The series strives to achieve the same layered effects as the mixed media works, but instead of physical layers, um, the effects are all created through illusion. The marking is more visually evident in this work. Um, they're created systematically. The grid is laid down with many translucent layers of color. The concentric rings are then stamped in place, first by following a very strict order that eventually breaks down into a more intuitive placement. And then the labor intensive marks are added last. Each color is minutely adjusted and, and then strategically placed to achieve an overall harmony and balance. And the marking phase of the process may take months to complete. In 2006, my work expands to incorporate paper cutting which I continue to work with in variable sizes. And paper cutting is another process that requires meticulous planning and mindful attention. With stencils inspired by Celtic knotwork and Islamic towel patterns, I trace and hand cut interlocking motifs into large sheets of painted paper, which are lined with silk. Using only a simple snap blade, I, am, I um, employ an arduous process to produce works that slow the making and subsequently the viewer. Intense color painted on the back side of the paper reflects off the wall and blends with a cast shadow. So in addition to the large paper cuts, I designed smaller motifs that can be tiled and traced into nine square grids that can be cut into mylar or paper. I use the mylar stencils to create monoprints and also encaustic paintings. And then lastly, uh, I, and then Lane may ask me about this later, I thought I would just share a few of the small works and collage that I've been making while sheltering in place during COVID. And I can only say I'm very grateful for the distraction 
that my studio provides during this very challenging time. So I, I can stop the screen share there and come back to here. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can see the piece behind me um, maybe a little more clearly in terms of the layering and the different kinds of materials um, than you did in the slide. Thanks so much. That was a great walkthrough, especially as you and I had talked about previously um, the genealogy of working with repetition and I could really see that in some of the works you showed. So I will be um, reviewing the media again and maybe adding them to, um, to my list of things to talk about in class. Um, if you don't mind taking uh, student submitted questions, I'd like to ask no, those. Sure. So uh, the first question is, why did you decide to paint the circles in the grid format? And you talked about it a little bit. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, the grid, I think, is the basic substructure of everything that I do. And it goes all the way back to my student years um, and my interest in American piece quilts and architectural facades. And it was um, also probably, uh, you know, connected to the time of in, in the art world when I was coming up and growing up and, and the grid was, you know, a real strategy that artists employ um, to structure their compositions. Um, all the materials I use in my paintings go back to the grid. Um, they're woven, they're open, they're closed. Um, it, it's just sort of the intrinsic substructure of everything that I do. What is, what do those tools look like? Is it a, is it you bent over a desk with a giant ruler or are you working on smaller sections at a time? In the works on paper, um, I work flat on a table um, and I'll lay out the grid very well mathematically um, with a ruler, but I, I, I put the ruler away pretty quickly and okay. then um, I work with the translucent uh, layers of paint and, and build, build that it's almost like pixels, you know, and, and, and um, build that layer up until it works just as squares, you know, visual squares. And I don't, I don't move past that point until I'm satisfied with it almost as a complete painting before I even do anything else. Okay. And then she also wants to know, um, what is the significance to adding smaller circles inside the bigger circles? Well, oh, just my obsessiveness. <laughs> <laughs> Just one of the things we noticed when, when the students were, were walking through the gallery is that they weren't precise. Some of them had kind of an eyeball effect, like a side eye effect, and some of them were, were very precisely nested right. within um, each the, other. The circles are actually stamped in with, I have all kinds of um, bottles, plastic contained bottles and, oh. and um, things that I'll, that I'll dip into a, a lot of, you know, spend a lot of time creating the uh, range of color that I want to use for each piece and I usually have at least 12 to 14 dedicated colors once I turn to the stamping element and then I, I'll just you know dip the plastic into a color and then stamp it down and so some of them have a much more squishy look to them you know because they have a wider rim on the, the, the bottle or the container that I'm using to transfer the paint um, and I start out very rigidly and very systematically following an order um, to the color palette that I've established. And then as I move into the smaller circles, progressively into the smaller circles, it kind of gives way to something more intuitive. Okay, that makes more sense next. Um, we have been talking about the intervention of a mechanical or a synthetic thing alongside the handmade that there's um, in all of the artists we're, we're looking at there's that conversation between the the handmade and the the right I think the, 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 the key word there is made by hand and um, you, tr you strive for perfection um, and the paper cutting that you know is not part of this exhibition but is also part of that you know there's no way to do it perfectly but you try and um, <clears throat> And it's this nuance that the hand translates through the materials that makes the pieces kind of breathe. And they're not like someone said, why don't you cut it with a laser? Like, well, that would kind of destroy the whole um, act of making it and the act of sort of um, viewing it and spending time with it. So I've always been highly invested in things that um, 
a very material material based um, in a physical way and things that are invest my hands you know and, and that my hand is revealed through the process of the making um, and in a way I feel like it's like an invitation to the viewer to enter into that creative process with me whether they're just doing it visually um, but they can kind of take it apart in certain ways and figure it out like a puzzle um, and uh, have you have you explored other shapes well, I'm really working with triangles. I mean, I was just drawn to triangles. Um, and I avoided the circle for a long time because I thought it was really hard to work with. And um, finally, I just embraced it and, um, and, and started doing more research into, you know, sacred geometry itself and, and found the circles to have so much powerful meaning. Initially, for me, it was like, so it was like zeros and ones. And I was using it as sort of an analog way of talking about what technology was doing. Um, not that I'm against technology, but I felt like we were losing something by having everything mediated by um, the computer and technology. And I think, you know, students and artists these days are, are hungry for something that is their hands touch and um, their hands create. And so I do think that you gain and you lose with every new tool that comes along. And so at first, it really was a very simple way of sort of speaking to that. Um, then as I travel and, and do more research into sacred geometry, it, it became a much more universal symbol for infinity or perfection or even God that is transcendent across almost every, well, I haven't found it to be different anywhere that I've gone and in whatever culture that I've explored. And um, I think it's just um, a way that can speak to what we share and what we have in common rather than always trying to parse it out by our differences. And so, you know, I know some artists get very political with their work, and particularly in these times that are very challenging. And I, I'm not like hiding my head in the sand, but I want to give an alternative to, to all of the divisiveness and try to bring people together and try to create environments through the arts and immersive installations that allow someone to slow down and, you know, put their phone away, turn it off, <laughs> you know, and just, you know, kind of regroup and be more mindful. And then maybe a, new, a different kind of conversation can come out of that. Can you talk just a little bit about the encaustic process? And we're students are familiar with paint and with the basics of sculpture, but um, we haven't gone yet with the, uh, talked about the resist aspect of encaustics. Yeah, encaustic is painting. Um, it's pigment that's been suspended in a molten wax and you work with it hot. And so that you're painting with melted wax that's been colored basically. And um, it's an ancient technique that goes back to the Greeks and it's an, an amazingly versatile, um, technique that's not just applicable to painting. I mean, it can be sculptural, like you say, and, um, and used in, in oh, just incredible ways. And I've worked with, I love working with materials. So that's just another one of the materials that I explore. And um, it has the ability to be opaque, translucent, um, thick, thin, um, you can scrape it, you can build it, you can make it dimensional. And so it's just very forgiving and it's very, mm -hmm. The trick is it's so easy to get something that's sort of visually seductive with it that you really, it usually controls you rather than you controlling it. And so you have to like really be willing to, to um, intervene when it gets too pretty or, you know, or um, kind of undermine its natural tendencies. But um, yeah, it, it's basically, you know, pigment in a molten beeswax product for the most part. You work on a hot palette and you, it air cools very rapidly. So you make one mark at a time. So it lends itself nicely to this sort of obsessive marking um, that a lot of us employ. And then you fuse it with a heat gun or a torch. And that um, makes the layers, one layer to the next bond together and, and make it very um, um, solid and um, stable. It sounds like it's a lot of building, a lot of uh, layering and building on top of each other. Usually I think artists work with it 
in, as, as in layers and building, adding and subtracting. I mean, you can put collage into it. You can cast forms out of it. I mean, it, it's, it really, you can do almost anything. It's so interesting with the range of works we have in the show and we're here as we're going through these artist talks, we're hearing a lot of similarities in approaches and in respect to the material and letting go a little bit of control to let the material do what it naturally wants to do. And that's very interesting to have so many different effects with a similar philosophy. Right, that's true. But then again, the, you, you, you also see in all this work, this um, sort of um, overlay of um, pseudo control, if you will, where you actually set up a structure um, and then let the structure deconstruct through the making. That makes yeah. sense. <laughs> I, I think so. Um, well, do you want to tell us what you're working on now? How has the pandemic um, evolved your, your process or your work or the subject matter that you're trying to achieve now? Well, um, let's see. I showed you the, the last slide with the little collages, which has been kind of fun. And, I, you know, I had the same notion as the other artists. Oh, I'm going to make one of these a day, you know, and well, that lasted a day. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> everything gets more, I, I have a hard time making things quickly and simply. Um, so everything tends to get more complicated as I go. But I've enjoyed making those. I'm going to continue to make those. Um, I'm also working um, on some mono prints um, using the stencils from the paper cutting patterns. And here again, those started out rather quickly as mono prints, and now they've evolved into the mono print is just the base, and then all the painting then gets added on. I don't have slides of them here, but several of the pieces that I've done since COVID started actually look very much like virus. And it wasn't intentional, but um, it's sort of just, you know, it's in the water and you kind of reflect back on what's on your mind. So I, I'm lucky in that I've, I've retired from teaching and I don't have to, to navigate this incredibly complex way of teaching through a webcam. Um, and, you know, I just try to use my studio kind of as a personal residency and, um, down there I'm in my studio every day and um, I, I'm not putting any pressure on myself to have this much done by this much time but I do have several projects that are um, moving forward and then I hope you know we'll have the ability to go out into the world and I continue to do curatorial work as well and so um, <clears throat> that all you know keeps me busy and distracted <laughs> from the stuff I don't want to think about yeah, amen to distraction. We need, we need that, certainly. Yeah, I was thinking, too, when you were talking about the, uh, the visuality of the pandemic and how that's being presented to people. Um, for our, my class, we're talking about subjects and symbols. How do complex ideas get reduced to these easily digestible bits that a large audience can, um, can understand? And that, that circle, again, we see that circle everywhere, the, the circle with the little brushes around it or the droplets or even that mask of shape has a, a roundness to it and that repeated image over and over again. And I, I would be very interested to see what, you know, a few years down the line, what 2020 looks like. Um, yeah, well, artistic production. Get past 2020, 2020. <laughs> as quickly as possible. But you know, the, the beauty of sacred geometry is that the ratios are embedded in the universe, and they're the same if you look on the micro level, if you look out on the macro level, if you look at your body, cellular division. It's all the same ratio, and so we all intuitively understand that relationship, and that's why cultures from all over the world come to similar sort of understandings of what the, those forms mean to them within their culture. And it, it's a, a way to communicate with each other when you don't have a shared language or a shared country or you know, a shared sort of upbringing. And I found that to be true with my travels to the Middle East. Um, we didn't speak English. We still were able to do workshops and create immensely satisfying work in spite of the fact that we couldn't talk to each other. 
we were talking through the materials and the, and the process. So I'm a firm believer that it's the perfect proof. It's a wonderful way to think about it. Very uplifting comment to end our conversation today. Everyone, thank you thanks so much for taking the time to sit with us today. For those watching, we will be talking with all eight artists from the Compulsory Measure Show tomorrow evening, Thursday, September 24, at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you can't join us, please check our website at misericordia.edu slash art for the recordings. We'll also post updates to YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. A downloadable catalog of all of the works in this exhibit is available per purchase at blurb.com, and we will post those links as well. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Rennie, and we'll see you next time.